Okay guys, welcome back to the channel, and uh, today I'm going to be talking about Cyberpunk 2077. Um, same for me as for most of us, this is a game that I was uh, greatly anticipating for some time. Um, although sort of from the sidelines, I liked the potential that this game had. Um, but I, other than one E3 gameplay trailer, I haven't been keeping up on this game at all. I haven't been keeping up on development news, although I've heard things through the grapevine. I haven't been watching all of the new trailers. I haven't watched, been watching all of the new gameplay sets and stuff like that because I really just wanted to keep an open mind, especially once it started to get overhyped um, and everything. So I'm gonna be doing some in-depth uh, run through the game. Now I have just finished a lot of people will just finish the main story and then just be like, okay, well, I, I rushed through the main story, and let me tell you about the game. Um, actually, I have done 100% of all the side quests. I have about 80 to 85% of all the achievements, um, and I have finished all but uh, one of the endings. Um, and that was actually because of a game, well, a mix of a game bug and um, something that I didn't realize was possible. Um... We'll get to that, but it, it the game is not always clear about when it's giving you choices. So I didn't realize I had a choice in this instance, and so the story branched out, which is why, first of all, I would recommend playing on this P on PC because apparently there is a huge issue with um, save game file sizes on the consoles, uh, and then not only that, you can save as much as you want. Your saves can be as big as you want on the PC, and you can have a very extensive save list. So, you know, I say, if any one of you guys are familiar with my Let's Plays, I save, like, all the time. And uh, so I have this extensive list, and you can go back and find where the branching paths are. But anyways, um, if you want the too long, didn't watch uh, version of this review, um, let me give it to you right now, because if anyone else is familiar with... Uh, my channel, I, I don't like to do a lot of scripting. I, I speak better and more fluidly off the cuff, but it does sort of uh, draw in a little bit long. So the too long, didn't want to watch sort of consolidation of this review is that, is this game good? Yeah, it's a good game. I don't think CD Projekt Red knows how to make a bad game. I have played pretty much everything they've ever made, um, which is basically just the three Witcher games. Um, and then of course this, and, uh, I like all of those games, um, some more than others, but I, you know, I like all of those games. I don't think it's a bad game. You know, people who are like, you know, bitching about it right now and stuff. I, I really, I think a lot of these people aren't articulating what their problem with the game is. I think most people, and this is another thing that, that's sort of common that sort of drives me nuts is everyone's focusing on the bugs right now. And they're just complaining about the bugs because it's the most on the nose thing that they can complain about. It's a, it's something uh, qualitative and, and somewhat quantitative that they can um, point to and say, this is why it's bad, without realizing, I think, that there is this sort of gnawing feeling in the back of their mind that actually that's not really what the problem with the game is. The, the problem is much bigger. So it's not a bad game, but is it is it, is it a disappointing game? Absolutely. It's probably one of the most disappointing games I've played in a long time. And I'm, I'm a little bit tired of the gaming industry do, you know pulling this kind of shit, um, where they sort of project one thing about how the game will be, and then you know people get an impression of what it should be like, and then they just deliver on the same kind of experience that we've been having game after game after game after game. Um, and so it's not a bad game. I mean, just like most Ubisoft games that come out are not bad games but they do feel formulaic and they're not game changers and they're not breaking new ground. And uh, this game does not break new ground. It is not a game changer. Um, and in fact, in some ways, it's a bit of a regression from some of the things that you could do in Witcher 3. So um, yeah, it, it, it's not a bad game. If you're interested in checking it out, you know, you might wait for some of the bugs to get fixed. You might wait for it to go on sale. Um, but it is not going to be what I think a lot of us hoped it would be. So let's let's get into the review proper now and really talk about why that is. Well, here's the thing. If you look 
And I've got some screenshots of Cyberpunk 2020, you know, the RPG, uh, tabletop RPG book up, up in front of me right now. Pictures of Night City, you know, artwork from like the 80s and 90s when this um, RPG was being made. Um, I've, you know, and also just the fact that it's coming from like a pure sort of tabletop um, pedigree. I think a lot of us assumed going into this that this game was going to be, you know, The Witcher... Well, especially Witcher 3, um, well, and the other two were very linear as well, was was sort of, at least narratively-wise, a very sort of linear experience. There were choices and, and sort of pivotal moments where you could change the outcome, but you're only making, you know, a couple of choices. You may get one cutscene versus another, one character might die versus another one might not die, but ultimately the story kind of ends up in the same place. Um, and there is a lot of conversation in the witcher 3 there's a lot of uh character interaction and you know your character has fully voiced lines and you know fully animated too it's it's cutscenes. it's not like uh first person to someone else fully animated and everything and there's a very good reason for this because you know the witcher 3 isn't really a role-playing game i mean it sort of is but it's not a traditional role-playing game where you decide who your character is. You build your character, you, you make them from scratch, you decide what they're good at, what they're not good at, what kind of builds you're going to go for, how you're going to respond to the world. The thing about The Witcher 3 is it's not a general role-playing game, it's a Geralt role-playing game. If you wanted to know what it's, it's kind of, it's more like the Batman Arkham series than it is like Skyrim in that respect. Because you're not playing as someone who just stumbles into this world and makes their own way you're playing as an established character with established with an established appearance with established abilities with an established uh, sort of profession or vocation or occupation um and while you can make certain choices about how you want to deal with things ultimately you're just role playing as that established character so if you want to know what it's like to live the life of Geralt and be on the road and take Witcher contracts and, you know, go to inns and, like, you know, gamble a little bit of money or go to a brothel and, you know, have a good time or whatever or, um, you know, get embroiled in the political stuff that he's not that interested in getting, you know, wrapped up into um, and going on adventures and, and, you know, you can sort of fight for justice or just let the world be the way it wants to be. Yeah, you do have some choice in there. But they're all going to be choices that you could conceivably see Geralt making and not necessarily purely yourself. Um, and so that's why it's not really a pure role-playing game. It's more of like a storied action game with role-playing elements because you do get to pick sort of your, your upgrade paths and stuff like that. But like I said, you're playing as an established character. So if that game is going to be more narratively driven, if that game is going to be more linear in places, if that game is going to be more constrained, it's understandable. You start up the game, especially if you've played the previous games, you know what you're getting into. You're not, you're not going to turn Geralt into a, you know, a 100% mage because he is a witcher, so he has to fight with his swords. You know, you're not going to turn Geralt into a, you know, a silver-tongued devil with a bunch of uh, speech uh, check um, skills where you can just talk your way out of anything. Although you can a little bit in the game, but largely at some point you're just going to have to get into some fights. You know, you're not going to be able to build Geralt exactly the way you want to because he's Geralt of Rivia. He's an established character. Um, and so when they announced Cyberpunk 2077, and here's another thing to keep in mind. Some people were saying, like, well... It, play, it feels a little like Witcher 3, but what did you expect? I mean, it's from the developers of Witcher 3. Well, those people haven't played Witcher 1 or Witcher 2, because Witcher 1 and 2 are very different. Like, each entry into the Witcher series is its own game with its own uh, differences and even genre. The first game is more of a sort of tactical-style RPG kind of like maybe World of Warcraft or something like that or or things like uh, maybe like Pillars of Eternity except it's not it's not you know isometric or top down but there's much more of an emphasis on picking the right upgrades for Geralt um, picking the right equipment and using the right potions and spells during combat 
to come out on top. And also making sure you're not fighting enemies that are higher level than yourself. If no, if none of you have played The Witcher 1, the way it works is it's a lot like World of Warcraft. You go up to an enemy and you press um, attack and Geralt will just kind of keep attacking. Um, and the only other active thing that you are doing is um, occasionally a little uh, icon will pop up, pop up on screen, and if you click again, he'll, you'll get a critical uh, hit. Um, but other than that, you're just managing his potions, you're managing his spells and things like that. I think you can do some maneuvering and some dodging, although it's largely pointless. Um, and uh, also, it's a little bit more like a Bioware RPG, where... It's not purely an open world. You're, basically, the game world is divided into these like kind of like mini open worlds that aren't even that open because really, if you follow all the road like the road pathways, you know, in the game and you know the little uh, clearings and things like that, you're not going to miss any content. Much like uh, Knights of the Old Republic, you know, the, there's v there are very few places in Knights of the Old Republic where if you completely go off the beaten path, you're going to discover something. Most of what the game has to offer is right in front of you, you know. It, it doesn't really reward exploration as much as it rewards whatever you can see right in front of you right now. Just interact with all of it and you will get the total experience. And that's what Witcher 1 is like. Another way in which Witcher 1 is different is it takes place inside of one city, right? And it's not even a super large city. And they make the city feel bigger than it probably should and, and sort of... Uh, have more depth and stuff by the fact that there's quite a bit of stuff to do in there and again it is just one city you know compared to Witcher 3 it's like almost a whole continent well not quite but it's it's much it's a much larger area that you're um, interacting with in Witcher 3 then you go to Witcher 2 right so that's Witcher 3 um, and it's really more about like I said that the combat's more about like um, tactics and strategy and planning you know all of your all of your uh, buffs and and perks and things like that. Then Witcher 2 is much more of a sort of hack and slash style uh, RPG where you take a much more active role in combat. You have to dodge, you have to make sure you don't turn your back to the enemy. Um, you actively use spells. There's a one-to-one -one input roughly of your attack, you're, you're pressing buttons to Geralt attacking. So it's no longer that sort of World of Warcraft style of kind of taking a back seat to combat almost it's very active and you have to be good at fighting in the game and be aware of of your opponents and be aware of your surroundings and things like that uh, to successfully fight in that game um, however compared to Witcher 1 the little mini open world areas are much more linear and much more constrained I mean even more so than Witcher 1 where really there's almost no point in going off the beaten path you might find a few side sort of quests or objectives or something, but by and large, um, they're incredibly linear, corridor-like maps that you're going to be going through. And again, unlike Witcher 1, because it's sort of a globe-trotting adventure in Witcher 2, um, you know, you can't go back to previous areas to be like, oh, well, I, I saw that thing that there was a monster guarding it, I couldn't fight him, but let me go back. You can't, because you're constantly going to whole new areas. Witcher 1's story was it had greater implications for the world so it was it wasn't quite like you were saving the world but there were elements of it but it was a much smaller story it was really just about Geralt's Witcher uh, school the school of the wolf and um, this clan called the Salamander that had stolen these um, um, mutagens from them um, whereas Witcher 2, you know, but it was a smaller story, and again, it just took place in the politics of one city. Witcher 2 involves the fate of not just one city, but many kingdoms, and even, you know, the entire continent that, that Geralt resides on. Um, and it feels a little bit more like an episode of Game of Thrones, where there, the political intrigue gets a little complicated. If you're not familiar with some of the characters from the book, you're not going to have... You're going to understand Geralt's general role in the story but the plot overall may be completely confusing and just go over your head because you're just like who the fuck are these people i have no idea so it's a lot more about political intrigue and um again it's it's much more linear than witcher one and it's it's again it's 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 just a linear sort of hack and slash game um 
And it feels very different from Witcher 2. Enter Witcher 3. Now you have a game that is open world. You can go wherever you want. You can go in whatever direction. You can. There are tons of side quests. In fact, the side content in the game vastly outweighs the story content, which was not true for the first two games. Well, maybe the first one a little bit, but the second one, surely not. Um, in, in Witcher 3, you can, you know, and there's a better upgrade system. Not that there wasn't in the first two games, but it's definitely more important in Witcher 3, I think. Um, finding items and, and equipping yourself uh, with new stuff. Um, you know, Witcher 1, I think it was pretty much just uh, weapons and, and potions and stuff like that. I don't think there were drastically different armors for Geralt or anything. Witcher 2 there were. But yeah, you see, it becomes a little bit more like a traditional open world RPG in Witcher 3. And there is a little bit more dedication to immersion. I mean, you can actually, if I remember correctly, you can actually sit down on tables and chairs and bars and have a drink. Um, there are little gambling mini games, um, once again, which were in Witcher 1, but I think they went away in Witcher 2. So now there's gambling mini games. So um, you can go get your hair cut and then your hair will grow back in pseudo real time. Um, or at least your beard will. Uh, you can go to brothels and and you know shag a winch or whatever. You can you can do these things, and there's much more of a commitment to okay, what does the player do outside of the story, and what does the player do outside of side quests? Um, and the combat is a little bit more like uh, Batman Arkham Asylum meets uh, Dark Souls, you know. Um, so it again it takes on a, a bit of a different you know it is i would say that good combat is a little bit more about pure challenge than it is in witcher 2 and um what that's one of the things i liked about the game was i felt like um on the normal difficulty for example had a really healthy challenge you know you couldn't ever really like in combat you couldn't ever really let your guard down you always had to be on your toes and until you got like max level in the game even early level enemies in the game could still wreck you pretty fast if you weren't careful so that's kind of it was kind of nice to be sort of realized like it, it helped reinforce the danger of the world now i know i'm sort of rambling at this point so the reason that i'm bringing all this up is because witcher 1 is a very different game from witcher 2 which is it's not like like far cry where you're getting a very similar experience with each new game you're just getting new stories and characters and maybe some new weapons and stuff no Witcher 1 is a very different game from Witcher 2. Mechanically, um, uh, it, it, in, narratively, in every conceivable way, right? So when people are saying, like, well, it's just like, you know, let's get back to Cyberpunk. Well, it feels a lot like Witcher 3. What did you expect? No, I expected that this studio would be able to make completely different games. Let's, you know, I, you know, I know that I'm obviously a Looking Glass Studios fanboy, but let's look at them, really, you know? Ultima Underworld was a completely open-ended sort of RPG, build your own character, do things the way you want, and it was an immersive sim as well, uh, allowing the player to uh, deal with the obstacles in the game and solve uh, the problems that the game put in front of you in whatever way you saw fit and in many, many different ways using your build um, and, a, and a large degree of interactivity with the game world. Um, then, you know, their next game was System Shock, which kind of uh, shrugged off some of those elements in favor of a more sort of uh, focused experience. But now it's a sci-fi shooter with actual shooting mechanics and guns are very important and movement and strafing become very important. Then contrast that with some later. Then they worked on flight simulators, which had like a, a, a real fluid dynamics model that allowed the plane to... to actually behave as if it was achieving lift in real time, you know, rather than um, just the game engine telling it, okay, now you need to increase your your uh, Z-axis um, values. Um, and then you've got Thief, which is a first-person uh, stealth game. Um, you know, these games are wild, you know, a first-person stealth game with uh, no RPG mechanics of any kind, but again, still a very detailed, um, immersive game world. These games are mechanically drastically different. You know, Looking Glass Studios made so many different kinds of games, and they never had to feel that much like each other. You could feel their thumbprint on the game, which is fine, but the mechanics of the game were so drastically different that 
you could be sure that if they wanted to make a certain style of game that they could do it without it being like, well, this is just Ultima, but you added a light gem, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, Ion Storm as well, you know, Ion Storm was comprised of many looking glass people and Deus Ex feels very different from a lot of the other games that they worked on um, when they were at Looking Glass Studios, like System Shock and Thief. Um, so, again, going back to what I think a lot of us were anticipating when Cyberpunk 2077 was announced was basically, I think that we were anticipating a sort of balls-to-the-wall crazy cyberpunk universe where you could carve out your own path and become your own character and do all sorts of cool things in the game world. You know, we expected a large degree of openness. We ex expected a large degree of depth to the world where, you know, you could explore the entire city and go inside buildings and on top of high rises and, and see all this stuff. I think we all also ex expected uh, mechanically there to be a lot of open endedness, not just in how you build your character, but in what ways your character can interact with the world. You know, are you going to be a hacker? Are you going to be sort of a street thug, thug using, uh, you know, sort of um, hybridized, you know, hobbled together weapons, you know, um, to get into turf wars and stuff like that? Are you going to be like a corporate merc who, uh, you know, uses like lots of technology and has like, you know, um, lots of financial resources at their disposal to, to grab new t stuff? Are you going to be like a hacker? who, you know, goes into the net and, like, breaks into people's shit, steals their money, maybe even changes their identity, maybe even wipes their memory, um, or you can hack your way into buildings. Um, and that's just the mechanics of how you interact with, like, different missions in the game world. But I also think that a lot of us expected there to be more in-depth mechanics for how the game world operates. You know, uh, for example, maybe you could become, you know, allied with gangs so that if you got into uh, warfare in the streets with the cops or something like that, you could get backed up by them. Um, maybe if you allied with the corporations, you could call in, you know, support dropships or you could call in mechs to come in and assist you with certain things. Uh, maybe you could become the head of a crime um, syndicate and start earning money that way. You know, people have to pay, you know, up the top like a pyramid scheme. Um, and so it's a way for you to make tons of money and have tons of influence. Um, I think we expected you to be able to buy different apartments and, and sort of carve out a life for yourself in Night City. Um, I think we expected, too, to be able to, all the little choices that they talked about, to, you know, your appearance and your gender and all of this stuff to have, um, wildly different, uh, applications in the game world. I think people expected that, uh, there was going to be a ton of stuff to do out, like, like I said, you know, I, it felt like when playing Witcher 3 that they really sat down and thought about, okay, uh, when you're not doing a side quest and when you're not on a story mission, what do you do? And they thought about stuff to do. And is it as deep as I would like? No, but there was a commitment to living Geralt's life and role-playing and exploring. So enter the actual release of Cyberpunk 2077. And I've got some notes right here, and we're just going to go through it. So... The game didn't deliver on basically any of that, okay? It didn't. And it is not open-ended at all. The city is largely just one large facade. Yes, it's huge. It's a huge map. Yes, it's visually very impressive. And there is a lot of visual detail down to like even little scattered bits of cups and trash on the street. There's not a single alley in Night City that doesn't have an incredible amount of visual depth and detail. But visual depth and detail is just pretty lights, okay? It doesn't translate always to an interesting experience. Walking through Night City your first time in Cyberpunk 2077 is going to be interesting. And it is going to um, be impressive and there will feel like there's a lot to explore because of all the detail that there is on the walls and everything like that but after a couple trips through night city you begin to realize okay every single door to every single building unless it has and this is not an exaggeration if a building is not quest relevant you cannot enter it which means that the only buildings you can go inside in the entire game at some point there will be a quest that lets you go in there to do something. 
that's a huge problem. There were plenty of places in Witcher 3 that were not quest relevant that you could go, like people's houses and this and that and, you know, whatever. It's weird that there's so much of a regression from the open-endedness, and I would not call Witcher 3 a really open game world in terms of being able to explore every nook and cranny, you know. There are a lot of locked buildings in the cities. There are a lot of just sort of like window dressing type visuals in the cities and towns and stuff like that. But for at least 30% of the town is at least explorable though. But like I said, if 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 a building that you go up to in, in Night City in Cyberpunk 2077 does not expressly have some quest or side quest related to it, you cannot go inside of it. It is complete window dressing. And actually... There are a lot of parallels to draw between this game and Outer Worlds, which got um, similarly lambasted on release, and I think fairly so, for the same kinds of issues. You know, when in Outer Worlds, the first time you walk into Edgewater, you know, I remember sauntering up to the saloon thinking, hmm, I wonder if I can sit down and have a drink and get drunk. I wonder if I can get into bar fights. I wonder if I can... Um, gamble and play some card games. I wonder if I can, you know, change the music selection. Like, uh, what are the things that I can do to interact with the game world in the saloon to feel like I'm living in this world? Nope, same shit that you've seen in every other game. You walk in and you could say, I'll have a drink. And then it just opens up a menu for you to buy shit. And of course, alcohol has no positive effects in the game, so why the fuck would you ever buy it? You know? At least in Witcher 3, I think alcohol helped your health regen, although you got drunk off of it. You know, compare this to something like Red Dead Redemption 2 where, man, I mean, the whole game is centered around, like, what can you do outside of side quests, you know? Going into a town uh, like St. Denis is super fun, you know? You can sit down, you can have a meal, it will have a positive effect on your player's stats for uh, a short period of time. Um, you can take a bath, you can get a haircut, you can get new clothes, you can change your appearance, you can... Uh, buy new guns, you can clean your guns, you can get a hotel room and sleep for the night, you can gamble, you can get into drunken bar fights, uh, I think you can even get hung over in the game. Um, you know, you can go to the movie theater, you can go to the to a vaudeville type uh, production, there's a lot of stuff to do when you walk into a city, there's a lot of stuff to do when you walk into a town, um, there's none of that you can do in uh you can even sit and you can set up camp and sit on the edge of a cliff and look out over a beautiful view of a valley or a mountain and have a cup of coffee you cannot do that in this game unless it is strictly part of a side mission where some character wants to talk your fucking ear off and you sit there and you can press yes i want to drink and you sit there in first person and drink coffee, but there's no other point in the game where you can just say, hey, I had a, a rough day out, you know, bounty hunting or whatever. I'm going to go up to this saloon and sit down and fucking, you know, have a drink and get drunk. And then maybe I'm going to gamble a little bit of the money that I earned today and see how Lady Luck is treating me. There's no point in the game where you can have that experience, right? But let's get into even more of the depth of that. That's just depth of interactivity with the game world, all right? Um... So yeah, the game is good, but it's wildly disappointing. Um, and as I just have said, uh, explained too, there's no real open-ended gameplay, I mean, in the larger sense throughout the world. Uh, you can make a couple of different decisions in the story, and they are going to have impacts on the story, but again, it's not... It's not like these large branching paths like you might get in a bio, like a Mass Effect or something. And it's, it's not... Uh, um, I just didn't feel that my choices really mattered in the large scheme of the game world. And again, um, there is too much emphasis on story. Again, this is why some people will compare it to Witcher 3. There are a lot of sitting and talking with characters in first person and having a lot of conversation. Except again, you don't get to pick... I'd say 60 to 75% of what your character says, you don't get to pick what they say. And... Most of the times that you do, you're not really picking a different choice, right? You're just responding. And so there is largely no point for the um, discussion trees. 
the dialogue trees. There's largely no point for the dialogue trees in the game, except for a couple of instances. Well, I'll tell you right now, here's the thing. You can tell that this team was designed by a bunch of different splintered teams because when the game works well, it works well. There was a side quest, for example, where I was supposed to pick up uh, this medicine from this guy. And he was, I think he was gonna try and poison it and, and distribute it uh, as some sort of act of terror because he'd been wronged by one of the corporations. Well, I talked him down out of it. And there was a lot of interesting things going on here. Now the game doesn't relay any of this to you, so you, you could very easily fuck it up. But um, for example, if I were to have drawn my weapon, he, well, I did draw my weapon because he drew his, and he instantly freaked out. But that wasn't game over. He hadn't made a decision yet. So I actually backed up, and then he calmed down. And then I was able to, then then the dialogue trees actually mattered. And, and if I picked the wrong ones, he would have, like, freaked out and got angry at me. Problem is, there's no way to determine which one is the right one, a la, I don't know, Deus Ex Mankind Divided, which we will get to that game. Don't fucking worry. Um... So, uh, but here's the thing, the game never gave me a hint, like, if you're dealing with a, uh, a touchy, uh, suspect or something like that, don't draw your weapon unless you have to. If you're dealing with a touchy, touchy, uh, suspect, do not approach them. I just had to figure it out because I was, at least in that moment in the game, sort of immersed, and I was like, well, if this was real life, I would have my weapon drawn, because he's waving a shotgun at my face, but I would try and calm things down, you know? So I eventually calmed things down and he said, okay. And if I know if I had chosen the wrong dialogue, he would have shot me, right? So he said, okay, you, you know, uh, you're right. I don't want to hurt anybody. So he put the, put the meds down and went to go pick them up. And then when I left his apartment, um, I heard a gunshot. So instead of, you know, deciding to live, he still decided to die. He just didn't want to hurt anybody else. That is the only instance, really. There's a couple other instances, but I can't really remember them. But that's the only instance in the game where it felt immersive, where it felt like there was some interesting shit going on that I, as the character, had some choice or control over. Most of the other parts of the game, that's not true. And when I thought that I had fucked something up by my dialogue choices or things like that, I would actually reload a save and try it again with the opposite options. And nope, the game is just written that way. There's nothing you can do. That's the end of that story. Um... So, largely, it doesn't matter what you say to people in the game. So, there's really, there really shouldn't be any dialogue trees. And there's going to be a ton of talking and basically cutscenes all the time. And to the point that sometimes you're like, can you guys shut up so I can play this fucking game? Because, you know, and in, in something like The Witcher 3, it wasn't that bad because you knew you were in for a like character driven, narrative driven experience. But I also thought that Witcher 3 had much greater pacing with that kind of stuff, you know? Um, you would talk with some people for a while and then you'd get into some action. Also, I found the story of The Witcher 3 much more compelling. I found the characters much more compelling because I'd already been playing with them for two games. One of the missteps that this game makes is they want to make it extremely character-driven, they want to make it extremely narrative-driven, but they expect us to give a shit about these characters in the same way that we did Geralt um, and uh, some of the other major players, you know, like Zoltan and Dandelion in Witcher 3, but again, had you, you know, A, read some of the books, and B, played all of the games, you'd already have history with many of these characters, so it's easy to become attached to them and want to hear what they say or think about certain things or how their lives are going. Not so in this game, you know, because I, I was, again, I was not expecting this kind of type of game experience. I didn't give two shits about the story for Cyberpunk going in because that's not what I was here for. I wasn't here for a narrative-driven, cutscene-heavy, dialogue-heavy, sappy, character-driven experience where all people do is wax philosophical and talk about their feelings. I did not, I was not looking for that kind of game, and I did not expect that. So, uh, when you start the game, because we're just talking about all of the things that don't work in this game. When you start the game, you are not only asked to create your character and get their appearance down to... Um, like, even, like, uh, I played as a, a female, even down to your fingernails. Like, if you want to have your fingernails long, short, what kind of paint you want on them, what kind of, you know, lipstick you want, facial tattoos. You can get different eye implants to have your eyes have this, like, crazy look. 
select your hairstyle. Uh, there's a lot of customization for your face and nose and things like that. So you can really spend a lot of time customizing the appearance of your character, much like you could in Outer Worlds. And much like in Outer Worlds, it means fuck all in terms of the gameplay because in Outer Worlds, what happened? Oh, it's first person the entire game. You, there, you can't even use mirrors in Outer Worlds. Um, and they did eventually put in sort of a third person camera, but it's only when you're standing still. So when you're standing still in Outer Worlds, you can press a little third person camera and see yourself. Big deal. Like, and here's the other misstep that Outer Worlds made, is that you cannot change your appearance. Again, things that I don't understand. I mean, as far as I remember, even in Fallout New Vegas, you could eventually change your appearance. You could go to barber shops or plastic surgeons and change your appearance. If you were like, eh, I'm not happy with those choices I made. You couldn't do it in Outer Worlds, and it made absolutely no sense, even though there were a couple of barber shops in different cities. But you thought, oh, okay, well, Obsidian's a smaller sort of mid-sized studio. They might have had to rush the game out the door, blah, blah, blah. But this is CD Projekt Red. You know, they made arguably, probably the best or most popular game outside of GTA V for the last console generation. And they've got more money than God now, and they have an enormous team. So what, and they've been working on this for eight years. What the fuck? You cannot change your appearance. Not one thing about it. You can't get your nails did. You can't get your hair did. You can't do, you can't change anything about yourself except your cyber augmentations. Um, but that's it. You cannot change anything about yourself once the game starts. And I don't really give a shit if they add that feature in later. I don't want to buy a game on launch and have all the features trickle in over time. I put up with that shit for a game like Underworld Ascendant because I did really feel for the studio. I felt like they got the, the wrong end of the stick on that one. Okay. I think that they had a hard time because funding just kept falling out and falling out and falling out and they weren't able to have enough stability to work on the game proper. Whereas I don't have any sympathy for CD Projekt Red because they've had, again, limitless resources and a huge staff that we know they've been probably pushing well past acceptable limits to work on this fucking game. So... Um, yeah, you can't even change anything about your appearance other than your clothes once you start the game. You can't change your hair, you can't change, you know, your eyes, like, it's supposed to be, oh, a world where you can customize your body with all these, like, implants and stuff. You can't, yeah, I, I chose hearts on my eyes because I thought it would be, also, I thought it was going to be a different type of game. I thought it was going to be a little bit more surreal and wacky and punky, like, cyberpunky, like, a little bit over the top. But they tried to make this much more grounded, gritty story, and I'm like, ugh. But not, not even gritty, like a fun kind of grit. Like, just like, oh, God. Everything has to be, like, sappy and emotional and bullshit all the time. Um, so, anyways, you start by creating your character, all right? And then you get to choose your background. You get to choose if you were a street kid, you know, sort of a streetwise, um, you know, sort of tech uh, familiar sort of kid who, who, you know, knows how to sort of scrape by on the rough streets of Night City. They ch or you can choose if you have a background with the corporations or what they call the corpos in the game. Um, or you can choose if you're a nomad, someone who grew up, you know, in the badlands outside of the city and did a lot of things like, you know, driving around and salvaging and maybe even a little bit of highway piracy, right? And I thought, oh, this is cool. So there's going to be three different intros to the game. One where I learn, like, all the driving mechanics and maybe I get some driving perks and buffs and maybe even a free car. And, you know, maybe I belong to, like, a clan or a faction out there. And maybe uh, I have an easy way to make money. As long as I can uh, steal cars and take them out here, we can salvage them. And then I was like, oh, and then if I start with the corporations, I'll probably start with more money and more resources. Um, and I'll probably have access to, like, better armor and stuff. Um, and I'll have different things that I can do and maybe I can even have different perks like being able to wield my corporate influence to like scare lower level characters and be like, hey, yeah, if you want us to start, you know, if you want us to talk to the city and revoke your permit, you know, we can do that. Or, you know, if you, oh, I noticed that you're buying mainly Arasaka brand, uh, um, you know, augments for your, for your Ripper dock shop here. Uh, I, I'm going to make sure you can't get a hold of those anymore, you know. Um, and then I thought as a street kid, you might be like, oh, well, okay, you know, I'm, I'm kind of like, you know, I have to just sort of like make do with what I have. So a little bit scrappier, maybe maybe better at melee combat and shooting and maybe some hacking as well. Or maybe I use, a, I augment my body a lot to be better at those kind of things. 
and so a little bit of a scrappier character, but streetwise as well. And I figured there'd be different dialogue options for these people and things like that that would have an impact on the story or, or change the outcome of certain interactions. Um, no, it doesn't matter. You start in the same fucking apartment building doing the same fucking shit no matter who you are. It doesn't really have any bearing on the story other, overall except for the fact that occasionally in dialogue you can talk about some shit. And that's it. And again, these are not dialogue choices that change the outcome of your interactions. You cannot intimidate someone as a corpo. You cannot, um, you can uh, possess extra technical knowledge beyond your skill set as a nomad, probably. But it's not good. All it, all it will be is someone will be like, yeah, this is the T-35 whatever. And you'll be like, yeah, it's like an upgraded version of the T-28, except they put a turbo in the front. He's just like, you know your stuff. It doesn't get you anything. You're not going to get a discount. You're not going to change the course of dialogue. You know, you're not going to be able to, like, get more skill points or XP out of that discussion. Nothing. It changes nothing. It is such a load of horseshit. There is no point in having the different background selections in the game. It is really a fucking missed opportunity. So I think one... Uh, thing that would have been nice too and I think that was something that I would have been expecting to do in the game would be like I think I mentioned this a little bit earlier was that I you know with there is a large emphasis on all the gangs and corporations in the city but here's the thing there's no faction system once again a huge missed opportunity why the fuck are you going to make such a big deal about like oh the Valentinos versus the uh, Scavers versus you know, the Aldecaldos versus whatever. You can't really join any of these factions. You can sort of do it with the Aldecaldos, but that's story-based, and it has no bearing on the gameplay minute to minute. You can't call, you know, you you should be able, again, you should be able to have an open-ended experience and carve out your own life in, in Night City, you know? If you just want to be like a street punk who, who gets into street fights for money or stuff like that, you should be able to do that. Uh, or if you want to, like, knock over liquor stores and stuff like that. And uh, if you want to, like, you know, go into apartment buildings and, and rob people or, um, you know, uh, knock people out in alleyways and jack into their heads and steal all their banking info. Like, you should be able to play like that if you want to. If you want to be part of the gangs and get on all-out gang warfare in the streets, you should be able to do that. You should be able to become part of a gang faction or even, like, a head of a gang faction and be allowed to you know, call these people in for backup, or at least when you're in your territory, if the cops or anyone wants to start some shit with you, the gang members should swarm in from everywhere and just help you out in a fight, you know? Um, there should also be perks and intimidation perks for, you know, if you're on your turf and you're part of a gang, you should be able to intimidate people and be like, hey, I'm part of this gang, and you can get discounts, or you can get, like, free whatever, or you can just, you know, convince people to give you stuff without too much hassle, you know, like, during, like, story quests and stuff like that. Um... You should, as I said before, you should be able to, uh, there's only two hookers in the entire city. There's a male one and a female one. They're about five feet away from each other, and then they're one district in the entire city. That's it for, like, if you want to, like, you know, just go enjoy the, um, the sex industry or whatever in Night City. Like, there's, you know, you can go to bars, uh, and I guess there's one bar I went to where you can actually dance on the dance floor, but other than that, you can't go to bars and, like, sit down and drink. There's no gambling. Um, there's no interacting with the customers or patrons. Again, it's the same empty world, empty open world we've seen in a million fucking video games where you can't explore inside. You can't go inside of any of the buildings, as I said before, and you can barely ever go to the rooftops of, of buildings to look out on the city. Another thing that was a missed opportunity that they have in stuff like Far Cry is why are there no wingsuits or jetpacks or stuff like that? To where if you like if you're on like the top of these buildings you can like get down to the ground or you can jet over to another building like there's there was so many things that they could have done and again here's here's what CD Projekt didn't seem to understand. The main character of Cyberpunk 2077 should not have been V, which is the name of your character. Whoever you decide to make them, your character's name is V. It's not V, it's not Keanu Reeves, it's not whoever the fuck else. It's the city. It's Night City. That's the main character. So, what the game should be about is just making the city as open and free as possible so you can do a ton of stuff. Right? But you can't. The only things that you can do in this game are side quests, which will have some interesting stories someplace. Um, main quests, which are actually not the the... 
the combat and gameplay in main quest is not super engaging in my opinion um it's way too linear and then on top of that there are a ton of cutscenes and a ton of talking and people never shut the fuck up so it's actually kind of annoying sometimes um, and outside of that, you can just pick up gigs, which gigs are, ba I mean, there's a couple of gigs where you steal stuff, which is actually kind of cool, because you got to, like, break into people's high-rise apartments, but again, these are only places you, you can't go, you can't go into a nice apartment building and just start breaking into everyone's apartment and steal all their shit, you can only go to an apartment if it's part of a specific mission you've already been given, and once you finish that mission, when you try and go back into the building, you can't go in there anymore, what the fuck is that? Um, so, so this game feels very empty, um, and then you can also pick up, uh, I think, um, uh, police, the police will send out, like, requests for help or whatever, and you can pull over and, you know, I don't know, shoot some bad guys or whatever, and that's it, that's literally all there is in the game. Oh, I forgot, there's, uh, a short boxing uh, set of boxing missions, and those are horse shit, like, they're, at high levels, they're fairly easy, except for one, which this stupid lady can one-hit you, which is dumb, I'm like, I'm level 50 with, like, 2,000 armor, please don't tell me that she can one-hit me, this is dumb, and then there's, um, there's street racing, which I didn't even bother with, because, well, we'll get into some of this stuff, but, um, so, there's there's not a lot to do. There's not a lot to explore in in the in the basic open world of the game. And so, enter Deus Ex. I guess both Human Revolution and Mankind Divided. And fuck it, Deus Ex One and Two as well. Uh, I think it's very fair to to compare this game to Deus Ex because minute to minute gameplay wise, they are very similar games. At least in terms of the fact that uh, it's sort of an RPG where you can select a different build. Um, it's also a first-person shooter. There's also things like hacking. Um, there's also stealth. So it's really trying to let you pick your own approach. And um, in fact, in many instances, this game would love to be compared to Deus Ex Mankind Divided, but that would really be a disservice to Deus Ex Mankind Divided. Mankind Divided, I cannot believe, got such poor review scores, and now it's selling for, like, I don't know, like four bucks for the Game of the Year edition. Um, I mean, it did come out a while ago, but, you know, so did Witcher 3, and it's still $15 for the Game of the Year edition on, on most platforms. No, it's about 4 bucks for Deus Ex Mankind Divided. And uh, that's a game where you have free reign of a city like Prague. And honestly, I spend about as much time getting around in Prague in Deus Ex on foot as I do driving around the entirety of Night City in Cyberpunk. And that's really sad for Cyberpunk because Prague is about the size of my backyard um, in, uh, in Deus Ex Mankind of Edit. Um, and what I mean by that, you know, that's obviously uh, uh, hyperbolic. But what I mean by that is it's not a very large open world. But what it lacks in size, it makes up for in depth. Um, practically every building you can go into. There's a bank in the center of town, and you could, it's like a six-story bank that goes deep underground. You can break into the bank. You can go all the way up to the manager's office and steal. I think he has like a fancy sword or gun or something in there. You can go all the way down to the vault. You can steal a bunch of money, and this is not... Eventually, I think you do have to go there in there for the main campaign, but you can go in there whenever you want in the, in the open-world segments of the game. Um... You can go into any of the nightclubs. You can go into wherever the fuck you want to go in uh, Deus Ex Mankind Divided. You can go there. And you can explore people's apartments. And you can find little storied bits of information. And it doesn't break the quests either. Because if it turns out later that you already like ransacked that apartment to find whatever. And somebody's like, oh, I need help finding my credit shit. I couldn't find it. You're like, oh, here it is. I found it. Um... You have complete reign to explore that entire city. You can go onto the rooftops. You can traverse the rooftops. There's great jumping and stuff in that game. Um, here's the thing. Cyberpunk 2077 feels very much like that game, except for the fact that everything is on fucking lockdown. Uh, you can't go inside anywhere. And so it's really sad to see, because if it had had some of the depth of Deus Ex Mankind Divided... 
I think I'd be having a lot more fun with it, at the very least, just being able to explore the city and see a lot of different stuff inside the buildings, on top of the buildings, outside the buildings, on the street level, under the street level, you know? I wanted to explore the city, I wanted to carve out my own life in Cyberpunk. Um, and you can't. You play as V, and V is a merc, and he can't be anything else than a merc. I mean, I might have transitioned into a bounty hunter or merc anyways, but... I also would have, like like I said, you can't, do, do, you, you got storied side quests, which don't have a big impact on the game world. You've got, you can't even hire um, companions to go with you. Um, like, there's nothing you can do. And so, uh, it just feels very empty and very surface level. But again, comparing it to Deus Ex, so let's talk about, all right, let's say you, you're given a side gig, which is to say, okay, there's this mob boss, he's got these people kidnapped in his basement, you need to go to this location, it's like a, it's like an auto shop, and you need to rescue these people. So how does it work? Well, okay, first thing is you approach the place, you scan the entire area, you tag enemies, all while your Far Cry 3s, um, or even your Deus Ex Mankind Divideds, and then you have a couple different builds, all right? You've got a melee build. Believe it or not, uh, melee combat in this game is actually pretty fun. There's parries, just like in Witcher 3. They work very similarly, where you don't really get a little indicator. You just have to look for the uh, backswing. And about after the backswing and halfway through the forward swing is a good time to parry. I think the window to do so is a little bit um, small, but it could just be practice. Also, when I first launched the game on like the 1.0, uh, version, uh, I was only getting like 26, 30 frames a second. Now I'm getting like 45, 50. So they have made some performance improvements to the game that are really helping. Um, but melee combat is a barrel of fun. Plus you can get things like the mantis blades to come out of your arms or the mono wire, um, which is this like sort of like laser filament thing. Um, kind of like, I think it's directly out of Johnny Mnemonic, uh, that movie, if anyone's familiar. Um, but it's sort of like a floppy lightsaber that you can pull out of your arm um, and hit people with. I think it would be fun if you could do a Hitman-style takedown with it, too. But I don't know why they didn't put that in the game. That would be awesome. Fiber-wire people with the fucking laser wire. That would be awesome. And cut their heads off. Um, so there's a couple different builds. There's a melee build where you do a lot of combat in melee. And there's a quick dodge move in the game where if you double tap... Sorry, I played on controller because there's a lot of driving in the game. So I didn't even fuck with that on the keyboard and mouse. Because there's no way to control your throttle. It's either full throttle or none. Um, whereas you've got that variable uh, control on, on the controller with the trigger. So I just went... And also steering is way easier. Because um, again, there's a difference between a hard... You know, hard to port... <laughs> Like you're on a pirate ship spinning the wheel like crazy. Um, or I just need to slightly drift into this lane. So um, driving on the keyboard and mouse is just awful. Plus the base keyboard and mouse controls for the game are really fucked up. I didn't feel like they worked at all. And you can't remap a lot of the keys. Um, so anyways, on the controller, if you double tap B and then a direction, you will just kind of you'll just kind of zoom over in that direction. You can do it forward, back, left, right. It's actually pretty great. Um, and it's great for melee combat. Um, I would suggest if you're trying to do the uh, boxing missions in the game, just dodge like a motherfucker because it doesn't consume much or any stamina. Um, so if you need to recharge your stamina, just keep dodging around the arena like a motherfucker. Um, and uh, so you can go pure melee if you just want to beat people up, although I wouldn't recommend it. But you can. You can actually spec your character out to be an unarmed sort of melee character. You can do bladed combat like i said you can have these mantis blades that come out of your arms and you can like pounce on people and like stab them through the lungs um you can cut people's limbs off with uh, katanas and other uh bladed weapons you can throw knives uh you can use knives i think there might even be special knife takedowns although i didn't check it out um you can do takedowns from people from behind um so you can do a stealth build too where it takes longer for enemies to detect you um where you make less noise when moving around, where you do more damage and crit critical damage with certain stealth attacks and things like that. Um, you can combine that with a bladed uh, character. Obviously, there's also buffs for your just your overall health. If you want to make a sort of tank character, you can just give yourself insane amounts of overall health and reduce physical damage from all sorts of stuff. And then there's your uh, guns character. You got pistols uh, and rifles. 
and that's going to be tied to reflexes. And uh, the higher your reflexes, the higher your evasion stat, which um, not only I think increases the like or decreases the likelihood that you'll get hit while dodging, but also decreases the likelihood that you'll get hit while moving. So just as long as you're strafing and stuff, um, you're going to be hit less of the time. Um, and obviously handguns and, and rifles are pretty self-explanatory, though you can get some pretty nice buffs for uh, com combining uh, silenced handguns and stealth or silenced sniper rifles and stealth. Um, then there's going to be your uh, technology sort of build. Um, and this would be a sort of... Um, an additional skill, um, a supplementary skill. So you're going to want to have something like this with any other build. And this would be your uh, your ability to break down weapons and get more crafting parts out of them, to be able to craft new weapons from scratch, to be able to craft consumable items like med kits and ammo from scratch. Um, there's the engineering skill. I found that the engineering skill was kind of silly. It largely has to do with how much damage you do with explosives and reducing the amount of damage you take from explosives. Um, I also forgot too, you can, you can in a different part of the skill tree, you can upgrade your profici proficiency with shotguns and heavy machine guns. Um, and of course, like with most RPGs, like if you want to pick up a heavy machine gun, you have to have a certain amount of strength, or I think the, the skill is called body, but you have to certain, a certain amount of points put into that attribute. Um, and then there's the attribute of intelligence, which is, um, uh, that's going to be basically just hacking. And so when you approach, you know, this auto shop with the mob boss in it, right, you can sneak your way in and stealth kill everybody with knives. You can sneak your way in and stealth kill everybody with pistols or takedowns. You can sit on a rooftop on the other side and stealth kill everybody. There's even uh, um, hacks and perks that allow you to see people through walls. And if you get certain power weapons, you can actually shoot through walls too. Um, you can go in guns blazing um, with uh, you know, assault rifles or shotguns or whatever. You can use smart weapons. Smart weapons uh, have a just a super large reticle. It takes up like maybe, I don't know, 15 20 percent of the screen and basically anything inside that reticle the bullets will hit they don't do a shitload of damage but if you dealing with a lot of uh if you need a lot of crowd control or especially if you're playing on controller or whatever they can be kind of nice because you can just make sure that you're focusing on moving a lot because you don't have to have that pinpoint accuracy anymore you can just be like dodging all over like crazy and then just shooting people like crazy so um that works pretty well uh, you can hack everything, and the hacks are actually pretty cool in the game. You can hack security cameras, obviously, to be friendly. You can change turrets to be uh, friendly um, and shoot your enemies. Um, you can open doors, some doors and, and barriers with uh, the hacking from afar. Um, you can even turn people uh, blind. So if you're, do if you're trying to do like a, a pure stealth, or you can even ghost certain areas just, just by turning people blind. Um, you can literally turn off the optical processors in their eye implants. Um, if someone's detected you, you can do a memory wipe on them and they'll, they'll uh, go out of a combat or alert state and they'll forget that they saw you. Um, you can overload someone's synapses and kill them, like basically blow their brain up inside their skull. You can cause their microprocessors in their augments to overheat and that'll cause them to pass out. Um, you can short circuit all their augments and cause them to pass out. You can do what's called contagion. In universe, I don't really know what it's supposed to be doing, but basically... And kind of infect them with a computer virus and that can spread from you can actually if you upgrade it a lot it can it can spread up to like 10 or 15 people so if people are clustered together you can take out like conceivably an entire base of people with like one use of contagion uh you can cause them to uh you can cause their grenades to detonate you can hack the grenades on their belt and cause those to detonate um you can force them to commit suicide uh the hacking in my opinion was visually and and sort of Gameplay-wise, uh, pretty satisfying because you don't even have to have your pistol out. You can just sit there in the shadows hacking everybody. And it does remind me a bit of Deus Ex Mankind Divider where you could have these quick hacks to do anything from afar. You could uh, turn on and off security cameras really quick. You could uh, change turrets to uh, be on your side. I think you could even change, in Deus Ex Mankind Divider, you could even um, control enemies and make them... Uh, fight for you. You can do the same thing in this game. It's called Cyber Psychosis. You're, you're beginning to see how this game is a lot like Deus Ex. So basically, then you go to the, the auto shop, 
where the guy is. You have all these options for how you want to deal with things. Well, in addition to that, you can use different things. If you have a high intelligence, maybe you can get through an electronic door. If you have a high technical skill, maybe you can get through a mechanical door. If you have a high strength skill, you can just force, force do doors open. Um, there's a double jump and a high jump in the game, so you can augment yourself to double jump. And I will say this, the game has a fantastic mantling mechanic. You can climb on practically anything. Um, and as, as long as you've reached about sternum level, uh, jumping up to, to, to get to something, your character will automatically pull themselves up. Fantastic mantling mechanic, and it's one of the most solid point, parts of the game. Um, of all the game parts of the game that are buggy right now on release, it's the one part of the game that just seamlessly works all the time. I don't think I've ever had a bugged out uh, mantling or climbing bit. And with the double jump, I mean, there's almost nowhere you can't go. And the double jump is great. You can you can just get anywhere in the game as as easily as you want. And it's it's a little bit expensive, but I would recommend if you're playing, just buy it immediately. There's no other point in having other any other augment on your legs. Um, so you can double jump up to roofs. You can go in through vents. Um, there are a million different ways to get inside and out of these compounds. There's a million different ways to deal with bodies. You can hide bodies in crates so that they don't draw attention to themselves. Um, you can, when you hack security cameras, anything that any enemy that the camera sees it will instantly hide on your map so that part of the gameplay is excellent and honestly it's one of the things that's kept me playing so what it, what the game actually has that's there is actually very good i think combat is super fun i think whether you're shooting or stealthing um this the stealth isn't great in the game but here's the other thing you have to upgrade your stealth ability a lot you cannot and it's not like thief and i don't know why people won't use light gems but you cannot determine how visible you are sort of to the enemy you can only see how many enemies have detected you and of course line of sight is totally broken like it is in all stealth games that use a stupid mechanic where you can be behind an enemy and somehow they'll start seeing you you can be behind cover and they'll start seeing you um the game is a buggy mess right now so in inevitably there's going to be these things but the higher your stealth skill the longer it's going to take for them to detect you um, and that gives you enough time to headshot them, hack them, go behind them and, and knock them out. Gives you a lot of opportunities. So the gameplay is very open-ended when they actually give you the opportunity to play open-endedly. When they give you the opportunity to say, okay, you need to get from A to B and there's a bunch of bad guys there. And there's like vents and there's a ceiling and you know you can go outside and go on the roof and do whatever you want. But you just got to get from A to B. Then the game becomes really fun. Um, the other thing I would say too is that you do not get a lot of skill points in the game. Um, and your max level is not going to allow you to have enough skill points to really have everything that you want. So picking a build and sticking with it is very helpful. I focused on hacking primarily and I literally maxed out the attribute for hacking and maxed out my hacking skill. Um, and I rarely max out skills or attributes in games, but in this game I was just like, you know what, I want to be the best at this one thing and it really paid off. I mean. The end of the game was easy. The bosses were easy. There's very, there's actually no part of the game that's hard for me because I stick to my build. Now, if I try and get in a straight up gunfight, I die in about two hits, even on level 50. I'm on the max level in the game. But as long as I can keep a little bit of distance, I can take out anyone with hacks. There's no one or nothing I can't hack and do devastating damage to. Um, so I really like that you the 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 builds in the game work very well and if you i like games that reward players that take the risk of in of maxing out one of their uh abilities um so that they're the best at it you know um i've put a, I've, I've dabbled in a couple other things I'm, I'm okay at stealth um i've got enough in uh engineering to be able to craft some stuff and break down some things um and then i put enough in some of my handguns um so that I can do damage. I also do insane damage uh, because I have a, just a few stealth perks to help with this. Nice um, obviously, yeah, there's a perk tree system as well. I, I didn't feel like that needed to be explained. Well. You upgrade the base abilities. Um, the skills upgrade on their own, kind of like Skyrim. So the more you use stealth, the more you use hacking, whatever, you get a higher hacking yeah. skill. And then every time you get a new skill level in a... Every time you level up, you get a skill point, you get an attribute point and a, and a perk point. And every time you level up a skill by using it, you get another perk point. Um, and so 
uh, yeah, within the skill, like you could have a high handgun skill, but if you don't get any of the perks, you're still not going to be super effective. So it's very important that you select the right perks. Um, there are many perks in the game that are kind of stupid, and they don't really help you that much. So you do have to be aware. You can create a build that's kind of nerfed. You can really create a nerfed build that, that kind of sucks, which I like in RPGs. I like that if you make the wrong choices with how you build your character, um, you can have a really tough time. Because this game can be tough if you're not um, being consistent with your build. So I would say this. If you're starting the game, don't start picking a bunch of different skills and trying things out. You know, Actually, what I would say is find a playstyle that's working for you. Dump all your skill points in that. Um, and then once you... Well, yeah, I would say this game is going to benefit from multiple playthroughs, actually. Um, I wouldn't recommend the way I did it because I had a bunch of attribute and skill points left over towards the end of the game that I could have like. There, there is a particular save I'm thinking of where I think I have like 20 or 20 skill points just sitting around, or attribute points just sitting around, and a bunch of perk points. So I could have experimented with a bunch of different builds, um, with that, and I may go back to that save to try like a melee or try like whatever else. Um, but yeah, so the gameplay is going to be very much like Deus Ex. It's got a large degree of flexibility, and the actual gameplay mechanical systems are fairly well fleshed out. I think that the intro mission where they teach you all this stuff, which is the first gameplay trailer we ever saw in E3, it's the same exact thing, same exact mission, same exact animations and everything. Um, it's not great because you're not high enough in any of those skills for them to be any benefit for you. Also, the game's bugged and broken, so stealth doesn't really work well in that mission because enemies can detect you too easily and they're bugged. Um, your weapons don't do that much damage, so straight up shooting isn't that great. Um, hacking at that point, you're going to have basically no hacks available, so it's, it's not a great mission for teaching you the game. Um, Another thing that they show off in that mission that doesn't really come up that much later is uh, shooting through walls. And I don't mean with... There is a, a select group of weapons called power weapons, and some of them allow you to charge up shots and shoot through walls. Most weapons don't shoot through walls very well, though. And I think that that was sort of bullshit in the E3 trailer, this idea that it's like, oh, wow, this is really an immersive world in, 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 in attention to detail because, yeah, if there's just plaster between me and a guy with a heavy machine gun, guess what? Those bullets are coming through, and they're coming for me, so... Um, uh, that doesn't really happen in the game very much. Though, like I said, you can shoot through walls. You have to have a special gun to do it. It's not dependent on the material of the wall. So, um, yeah, speaking of, again, comparing it to Deus Ex Mankind Divided, most of the side quests that you'll be doing that are sort of storied side quests that involve, like, I don't know, breaking into someone's place or talking to someone or uncovering, these are largely just recycled from Deus Ex Mankind Divided. They're going to be very similar to that, which means they're fine. I mean, I liked the story for most of the side quests. They were great. I liked the things I was doing, but it's no different than Deus Ex Mankind Divided. And the kind of flexibility and freedom of approach that you have to the game is, again, basically the same as Deus Ex Mankind Divided. So I find it funny if this game's going to start getting great <clears throat> reviews while well, everyone called that game a steaming pile of shit, which it's not. It's a fantastic game. Um you know, that that there seems to be no intellectual honesty amongst people. Um, and what worked well in that game works well in this game. You know, I like I said, I think that once the game actually takes its hands off you and lets you just play it, it can be pretty fun. But it's just disappointing how lacking in depth the open world is and how little there is to do. So, you know, basically, if you're going to play this game, you got to play it for the side quests and you got to play it for the main campaign you can't really be playing it to explore Night City, which is a a huge misstep because that's what people were here for. Um, we're going to talk about some of the issues with uh, the gameplay and some of the bugs. Uh, again, there is this. Uh, there's a separate stat called street cred. So anytime you do something, I guess badass or whatever, like anytime you make a kill or even incapacitate someone or or finish certain objectives or uh, finish a job, you'll get street cred. And once again, it's a huge missed opportunity because, again, if you have all this renown and notoriety and street cred, people should be, it should impact your interactions with people in the world, you know? You should be able to become head of, like, I don't know, um, a, a mercenaries guild, or you should be able to, uh, 
technically you get better prices from some people and better, but like there's no dialogue that it affects, you know, like nobody's just like, oh my God, you're, you know, you're the famous, you know, fucking Merc who's been, you know, tearing up the city. There's nothing like that. There's nothing. So again, a huge missed opportunity to allow street cred to have much more of an impact on the world. You know, it could be that if, if somebody like, if you go into an alley and a gang wants to start shit with you, and then maybe the, the leader of their group is like, oh, shit, no, that's V, never mind, sorry, and they, like, run away. Stuff like that. And nothing ever happens like that in the game. There's no dynamic interaction with the world, really. So, uh, again, the street cred mechanic and, and the stat is kind of bullshit. The only thing it does is give you slightly better prices in some places, but nobody even mentions, like, oh, you're V, oh, my God. No, they don't care. Um... I would say that the cyberware is a little... I mean, if you have certain stats, you can get some stuff that's pretty good. And and there were some upgrades I really appreciated, especially as a hacker. Having my RAM regeneration, because that's... Basically, that's your resource for hacking. Like, you only have so much RAM, and if you run out, then you have to wait for it to, to dump or whatever before you can... Basically, recharge before you can uh, um, uh, hack again. And uh, so increasing ram recovery rate increasing the maximum amount of ram i have available to my system when i'm hacking things like that really helped the double jump aug was pretty great um you have an ocular augmentation but the i only found two augmentations the entire time one was determining the blast radius of grenades which was stupid and the other was um turning all of my weapons non-lethal if i wanted to go for a no kill run which was also stupid and I'm just like, is this really it? And I'm wondering if that's bugged that there's just the, the issue I found with the augs is there's just you don't find enough of them. The ripper docks don't seem to and it could be a bug too, where they're supposed to carry more as the game progresses, but they just weren't. Uh, but I I was finding basically low level cyber augmentations for most of the the doctors to implant. So. You know, once again, you know, you thought like, oh, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna be able to like make this crazy character with all these crazy abilities and powers because I can mod my my body out with all this uh, hardware and machinery. Nope, not really. Um, there are a couple of things in there. Like I said, double jump is pretty pretty awesome, um, but there's not a lot to upgrade your character with. There's very few augs that are that great. Um, Granted, there's a couple I didn't play with. I did play with the Mono Wire. I didn't play with the Mantis Blades yet, but I, I will for my melee build. Um, so anything that has, like, a physical thing you can do in the world, those are usually pretty cool. Um, but if it's, like, a passive, like, all the passive stuff that you add, just, it just wasn't that great. Um, so another thing i got to bring up that's kind of a cardinal sin of, you know, your sort of Deus Ex and, 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 and stealth game design is, and even Deus Ex is guilty of this, to some extent, um, is that if you get spotted, like if you're trying to go stealthily and you get spotted by one enemy, that's it. Every single guard in the entire place not only is alerted, but knows your exact position and will not exit the combat state until every single one of them is dead. Um, and so towards the end of the game, it was less of an issue for me because my stealth skill was pretty high. It was hard for people to detect me, but early on, it was just infuriating. I almost felt like stealth was pointless. Um, I also think patching the game helped a little bit, but it just made stealth ultimately really frustrating, and I don't know why games still do this. I do not know why everyone just falls back on the same old mechanics, and I think that's another issue I had with this game, is that it was supposed to be doing its own thing. It was supposed to be breaking new ground and being sort of independent and, and kind of reinventing the industry a bit, um, and it's not reinventing anything. In fact, it's taking too many cues from other people. In fact, I think a very apt comparison to this game would be like, uh, maybe Deus Ex meets Far Cry meets GTA. It has the depth of... Actually, the city in GTA, while it has a very similar layout and way in which it does things, it the city in GTA, it's got about the depth of the city in GTA, which is not super deep. Um, but GTA has more depth than the city for sure. There's more stuff to explore and there's more little like areas and things like that in GTA. Although now that you think about it, it is a lot more like this game. Um, and then sort of combat wise, it sort of has the depth of, uh, of Far Cry where, you know, breaking into these bases and stuff can be pretty fun and, and all of that. But 
you know, you wouldn't call Far Cry this really in-depth RPG, you know, the, the, when you go to the cities and towns and things like that, it's all very surface level, you can sort of, actually, I, w- I was replaying Far Cry 4 recently, even in the main city there, when you talk to people in the market, you're going to get little bits of interesting dialogue, and they will say stuff to you that's story relevant, and like, it's not a dialogue tree, but if you sit and listen to what people are doing, it is kind of interesting, right? And you can go in a few of the other buildings that are not just like, your your safe house and stuff like that so even in far cry 4 there's more depth to the towns and cities and 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 areas like that than there is in this fucking game um you know actually yeah and there's a lot of places to it like there's a lot of like abandoned homes in far cry 4 that will have like interesting little plots so yeah this doesn't even have the depth of the the open world that far cry 4 does and if you compare it again to witcher 3 i mean witcher 3 there were caves and dungeons and and castles that you could go inside and there was stuff to find and stuff to do there's nothing like that in this game you will never come across like a downed uh uh hover ship or whatever and go inside and, and read like a little story about how like the pilot is you know an alcoholic and he drank too much that day and then he like lost altitude and crashed and you know he wished he hadn't because he was ready to give up and and you know go back and see his family and that was like his last story. like you don't get anything like that almost never almost never in the game it is just the streets and the side quests and the main quests and that's it um even when you try and talk to people in the open world you you click talk to them and they give you like a little one sentence like and it's not even like relevant like oh hey v how you doing or oh i like your new digs it's just like don't touch me that's it it there's like there's just nothing going on another thing that bugs me and i don't even think it's a bug because i don't know how it could be uh it also seems pretty easy to fix so um the name of the city in Cyberpunk 2077 is fucking Night City, right? Okay. Um, guess what time it gets dark in Night City? I mean dark, like actually like it's actual nighttime. 11.30 p.m. Just before midnight. Guess what time the sun starts to come up and it's kind of twilight again. 2.30 you only have three hours of real nighttime in a cyberpunk game in a place called night city inspired whose visual design is heavily inspired by blade runner and you know i'm gonna put the picture some of the pictures from the tabletop rpg up right now this is a big problem it is almost never nighttime in the city it is daytime all the time now granted cd project red has a gorgeous lighting engine for this game um It looks gorgeous all the time, but it does not look like a cyberpunk game. It just, a lot of the time, because it's so bright and sunny and cheery. And there's a lot of bright colors used in the city as well. Um, Again, I'm going to put some of these pictures of this, of this, of the tabletop RPG up. Um, That's not really what's being portrayed here. I think it's called Night City because it feels like an endless night for the people living there. Even the daytime sections of the movie Blade Runner, it's still dark as hell because there's all this pollution and all these clouds in the atmosphere. And there's very few daytime uh, shots of that movie. I I think it's only when he goes to Terrell's uh, tower um, to interview Rachel. That's it. Uh, The rest of the movie is basically an endless nighttime. And I think that's why... They called it Night City in the cyberpunk because they really wanted the name of the city to sort of illustrate, yeah, it's kind of endless night. You know what I mean? Um, Like the movie Blade Runner, like many of the best uh, uh, cyberpunk stuff, I think even Johnny Mnemonic is pretty much all at nighttime. Um, Most cyberpunk movies just take place at nighttime. Split Second with Rutger Hauer, I think that's uh, all at nighttime. Um, So there's just something to the look of cyberpunk. Um, and again, I have to believe that's why the tabletop creators called it Night City. They're just like, well, we want to name this something, city something cool that really illustrates like something about it. And it's just like, yeah, an endless night. Um, you know, metaphorically, literally, um, philosophically, it's just an endless night. It's a very dark place. Again, another thing that I got to complain about here is if you look at look at the the stills I'm going to be putting up. If you compare the sort of grunge that this this evokes. You know, the idea, again, Blade Runner, there's, like, grimy shit everywhere. There's stuff that's worn down. It looks like there was no city planning whatsoever. Um, And there's a lot of buildings there that look very old, mixed with a lot of buildings that look very new. Um, This is not the case in Night City in 2077. A lot of the cities look brand spanking new. Yeah, there's some dirt and grime in the streets, but if you've been to any major city um, in your life, it 
it actually doesn't look that bad. Um, and there's a lot of bright colors too. So with all the bright colors and everything and the fact that it's mostly daytime and then the fact that uh, it's not really like worn down or rugged or, or gritty or anything like that, it just doesn't feel the same. It doesn't evoke the, the punk aspect of cyberpunk to me. You know what I mean? It, it's just like, oh, future game. This is a future LA game, you know? Another aspect of cyberpunk that people really don't understand, well, actually, most punk genres, you know, your steampunks and your diesel punks and stuff like that, is it's a mishmash of things that don't go together, right? Steampunk is like uh, more modern technologies in a, in a Victorian era, sort of pushing that steam technology to its limits and maybe even having like pseudo computers and stuff like that, you know? Um, steampunk in, in uh, Thief, for example, allowed, you know, had electric generators and robots and stuff like that. In medieval times, you'd have guards in plate mail or uh, chain mail um, wielding, you know, uh, long swords coming at you um, with these, like, uh, what are those long tunics that go over the, the chain mail? I forget. And they have these, like, sort of, like, crowned helmets and stuff like that. They're coming after you. And yet, uh, you can't turn off certain. You have to turn off certain lights with a, a light switch, because it's electric. You know, when you're in the basement, there's all these generators and stuff. So, the the mishmashing of these two things that don't go together, the old mixed with the new, is kind of what defines punk. And the problem with cyberpunk is it's pretty much all new. The cars have a lot of the cars have sort of 80s design aesthetic, um, but by and large, everything just looks like it's just future city. Right? It's not cyberpunk city. A cyberpunk city would have, you know, for example, they tried it a little bit. You know, you've got like the double barrel shotguns that have like the the uh, magnetic uh, accelerators on them. Um, so they turn into basically gauss cannons. So they do like a shitload more damage. You've got some stuff like that. But you never pick up like an AK that just has like, like uh, microchips and wires all over it and stuff like that. And you never, you, like you never pick up stuff like that. Like all the weapons look pretty brand spanking fucking new. Um, you never pick up, like, a 1911 with, like, some weird thing on the end of it, and you're like, I wonder what that does. I don't know, maybe it, like, helps accelerate the projectile at the front of the gun, or um, maybe it curves it, or I don't know. I don't know what, but, like, you know, you never pick up anything like that where you're just like, okay, this is clearly, like, a mix of, you know, old technology and whatever's going on and, and you know, whatever they've added to it just to, like, you know because um, these people are poor and, and maybe they don't have access to the newer weapons because those are restricted and so you just kind of like hobble together whatever you can that's why most c cyberpunk characters have all these wires and shit sticking out of their head and, and brain and shit like that because they're just trying to like hobble together whatever works to give them the abilities that they need and I'm not saying nobody looks like that in the game and I'm, I'm not saying you never see technology like that I'm saying by and large everything looks pretty fucking new so again you're kind of mi they kind of missed the point of what people were really looking for in a game like this. Another really uh, annoying design consideration that has to be pointed out is, um, regardless of what you play on, keyboard or mouse or controller, uh, the crouch button is the same button that is used to skip dialogue conversations, right? And I think a lot of people are going to drift into stealthy builds because there are a lot of points in the game where they're just like, hey, we need to keep quiet, we're breaking into this facility or whatever, everyone keep quiet. Problem is, when you go into a room and people start talking to you, you want to stand up so you're eye level with them while they talk to you, and if you press B, instead of standing up, you will skip the conversation. So I probably missed a good 5 to 10% of the dialogue in this game, purely because I was crouched and then people just randomly started talking to me and there was no way to uncrouch. And you cannot remap the button. Not even on the PC. So even if I was to be like, alright, I'll keep a ded dedicated just... Uh, uncrouch button on my keyboard so that when I'm playing with the controller and someone starts talking to me I can just press it on the keyboard while I'm playing. Nope. Can't do that. The, the skip button slash crouch button are always going to be the same fucking button. So that I cannot believe that wasn't play tested and someone says like hey I keep skipping over dialogue right now. You know can we fix that? So that's a weird thing that was included in the game. Um, Another bug that, I mean, I hope they fucking fix this, but I think it just really has more to do with the game's engine. Um, I don't know if it's a bug that can be fixed, is it's very difficult to highlight specific objects. You can go up and put your... See, because what it does is it, it's, it's a generalized highlight system. So basically, whatever your target reticle is close to, 
um, that's what will highlight, which means that there, if there are a couple of items on the floor next to each other, you can't highlight in the individual one. Like, let's say there's four grenades um, and one med kit, and it's like, well, I have enough grenades, I don't need any more, I just want the med kit. So you're trying to just pick up the med kit, or even better, a, a med kit and a rifle. Now, rifles weigh a lot, and I'm always over encumbered, so I'm like, I don't want the rifle, I just want the med kit. And nine times out of ten, you can't do it because the hitbox for how it's going to highlight or whatever is going to be overlapping and there's just no way to do it. And so this is very frustrating game of having to like do things like move bodies to highlight items, pick up an item you don't want and then either drop it or disassemble it somewhere else and then go back to pick up the thing that you need. It gets super annoying. Another annoying bug is if you're in there was I think it was one of the last missions in the game I was in a story mission. They forced me to pick up a weapon to quote unquote gear up for the final mission and because I was in a bar and you're not supposed to be able to draw weapons in your bar, there was this bug where I couldn't drop other items out of my inventory to take that weapon. So I was over encumbered through, so I had to walk over encumbered all the way out of this bar, follow these people to the elevator, get on the plane, and then actually drop into the mission and start fighting before I could go in and actually adjust my inventory. And it's things like that that just drive you insane. Just fucking, and it's like, st there's stupid things that should have been caught a long time ago in development so that when it launched i mean that's a story mission i shouldn't be having these problems in a story mission i shouldn't be forced to be and there was it's not like there was a, a version of my stash for my character in the in the hub for the mission as well so it's like okay the game's like all right well if you need to drop off any inventory go here first you know so you're not over encumbered i couldn't do anything so there's a lot of stuff in this game that's just like complete oversight and you're like how did they miss this it doesn't make any sense Um, driving is a pretty interesting part of the game. I would say that one of my other complaints with the game is that it's a little bit difficult to make money without completely breaking the game, uh, the game's rules, I mean. Um, for example, you can make millions and millions of dollars if you want by just uh, duplicating items and selling them, or there's a specific item where if you sell it to a shop, um, it sells for 4000 and if you want to buy it back, it, it, it sells for five. and then if you sell it back to them, it'll sell for 4000 again, so you can just cheese that. But I don't want to have to sit there and grind those for an hour just to make money. Like I said, I can't believe there's nothing to do with the factions. There's nothing to do with stealing and salvaging cars. There's nothing to do with any of these mechanics that allows you to make a little bit more money than like the 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 bounties you get for a lot of these side quests are pretty paltry. They're one to two thousand. And when uh, I think someone calculated it, you need one point eight million dollars in the game to buy all of the cars, which is an achievement. So as of right now, I'm pretty sure the only way you can get that achievement is to rob every single per like empty your inventory rob every single person you see and sell everything that they were carrying do this all the time um, and grind that for hours or grind um, duplication uh, glitches for hours uh, and that's the only way to make enough money to actually accomplish that achievement so once again they fucked up there because it should be way easier to get enough money to buy all the cars I mean it shouldn't be super easy but I'm level 50 I've put about 85 90 hours into the game I've done every single side quest, and I still only have about $800,000, right? Granted, I've bought some stuff, but I, I don't think I've ever spent more at one time than maybe $50,000 on an item, and I haven't bought that many items. I bought a couple of um, uh, cyber augments, and I bought a couple of uh, crafting items, and that's about it. I haven't per purchased anything else in the game because I've just picked everything else up out of the world. So... That doesn't make any sense, but onto the driving, I would say that it's kind of interesting. It's one of the first open world style games like this, um, except for maybe Far Cry, where, well, no, not this doesn't apply to Far Cry because that's off road driving. Um, you know, compared to something like GTA or any other open world game that has uh, like a city game that has cars, this is the first one I've played where it's actually not super difficult to obey basic traffic laws. You know, obviously I run red lights and stuff like that, but I'm not like swerving all over the road, crashing into every single person I meet. Um, I'm not, you know, it's easy to drive inside of the lines. It's easy to change lanes safely without having to like, you know, um, pull off these crazy maneuvers and stuff. Um, the only problem I have is sometimes the cars drive way too slow, so you do have to go around them. But I mean, just staying within the lines on the road and getting through intersections safely and taking turns safely and staying in your lane... This is the first time I've ever played a game where it's doable. 
I mean, GTA 5, I hate fucking driving around in GTA 5 because those cars control like shit. They've got no traction. Their acceleration is really weird. They can't turn for a damn. You know, they usually, they either, their turning radius is either too wide or they fucking spin out. Um, the driving in GTA sucks. And it always has because of their terrible physics engine. So it's kind of interesting. And here's the other thing, too. The driving this game, it feels a lot more like um, like a racing game, like dirt or something like that, you know. There is a lot more attention to things like traction control and um, uh, decelerating just before a turn, and then you get that little bit of extra traction if you accelerate coming out of the turn, and you get that little bit of a correction. You can do a little bit of drifting here and there. Um, so I would say that driving, it's it takes a little bit to get used to. I would recommend playing on a controller. I don't think, unless you are guns only and you're not using smart guns and you need to get a lot of headshots, well, even then, there, there's a little bit of an auto-aim with the controller, so I would just recommend playing with a controller, to be honest. Uh, also, the, the controls for the controller make a lot more sense, and that's another funny thing, is that it's having such a rocky console release um, right now, yet it's very clearly at least control-wise, was designed primarily for consoles. Um, it doesn't run particularly well on the PS5. Uh, the Xbox Series X is having a lot of issues, although apparently it runs more stably on there. It's having a ton of bugs. And then, of course, it basically doesn't run at all on the Xbox One or PS4. So it's amazing that it was. It, there were so many sensible decisions made to keep it. I mean, it's just, you can tell, it's, it's a total uh, Franken-game. You know, because it was supposed to be for the last gen consoles, but then they were just like, no, we need to make it for the new gen consoles. So they put on all this ray tracing and stuff, and they really upped the graphics. But I think that was to the detriment of much of the gameplay and and much of the the openness of the open world. Um, it was designed; the controls were designed for console, but it it really is a better PC game right now. It's so um, unless you have a controller for your PC, I think the controls kind of suck on the PC. Uh, it's just it's such a it's such a fucking mess right now. Um, but I just wanted to point out, yeah, that driving can be pretty fun. And, in, in, you know, motorcycles are actually super fun to drive around. And uh, uh, the car handling is such that it's actually fairly easy to just stay in your lane. I mean, I've never played an open world game before where driving, you can stay in your lane easily. Usually your car is drifting all over the road because it's way too sensitive. Um, also, the roads are very wide in this game. That helps as well. Lanes are pretty wide, like they feel in reality, so it's not hard. You know, most games, it's like the lanes are about the width of your wheelbase, which is ridiculous. So um, so it's funny, I know I sort of mentioned at the beginning, but, uh, you know, I, I'm talking about a few of the bugs now. Uh, some of these might be fixed, some of them might, might, might not be fixed. Uh, like I said, the highlighting objects thing, I don't know. Um, I expect basic bugs like AI glitching out. Um, actually, oh my god, I had the craziest bug the other night. Now, I, I'm just telling you this because it's a funny story, but... Uh, it was during one of the final missions, and I was supposed to kill all of this assault team that was uh, attacking my, my group of people. And um, one of the guys clipped into the ground. So I literally was standing on the spot on the map where it said he was. And he was clearly like, moving around trying to look for me and shoot and stuff like that. And I surmised he had clipped through the ground, ground because he wasn't anywhere to be found, and none of the dead bodies around him still had like life signs or anything. So I was like, well, I don't know what the fuck to do. You know, I was just like, I don't want to have to reload that whole battle segment because again you can't save during campaign missions so i would have had to start from the last checkpoint which was probably like i don't know 15 minutes prior so i was just like what the fuck am i going to do with this guy so i just kept throwing grenades at the spot it says he was on on the ground and they think finally one of the blast radiuses for the grenade you know clipped through the floor and was able to do enough damage to him to kill him so it did that but i mean just crazy shit like that you know um I've had missions completely bug out, you know, sometimes, like, characters won't load in right, I've had, uh, just a ton, it, it's just a, it is a buggy mess, but I will say this, except for, uh, a couple of achievements that didn't, uh, unlock for me, um, and I had this similar experience with Witcher 3, although by the time I would, had played Witcher 3, it was already Game of the Year edition, and been patched to death, and everything like that, so... You know, people said, like, Witcher 3 was kind of buggy at launch, but I was just like, what are you talking about? It's so stable. I didn't realize. I mean, I didn't think, um, oh, yeah, I'm playing a heavily patched version of the game. That's why. Um, but this game, I will say, much like my experience with Witcher 3, while there are bugs, the most frustrating bugs I experienced in games like Skyrim is where I couldn't finish a quest. 
I couldn't get an item because someone didn't drop it. Um, things like that where I my progression, maybe not through the main story, but my progression through things that I was interested in doing was halted because of a, a, a serious bug that even after patching wouldn't get fixed. Um, I'm happy to say that in this game, I except for, like I said, one achievement, actually two achievements, um, I haven't had any issues like that where, uh, you know, a quest will bug out so bad I can't finish it or a character is supposed to give me like a key to enter a door to get to the next stage of a story mission and then I just can't even do it. Um, I haven't I haven't experienced anything like that. Um, as, as bad as the bugs are, I, th I think it's a misstep for people to be focusing on them. And um, I think if some people would point it out, the reason that they're focused on them is that the game is just not... The game proper, the open world aspect of the game, the city, the depth of the city, the RPG aspects like role playing, you know, having a life in Night City is just not interesting enough. And I think what people aren't realizing is they're they're grasping at the bugs saying this is why it's bad because either they haven't realized or they don't want to admit yet that the game itself is just not that good. Um, and that's why they're upset about it. They're not necessarily upset that it's buggy. They're upset that it's not anywhere near like what I think most people thought this game was going to be, um, including myself. And, you know, from some of those early E3 trailers, it, it really seemed like, um, you know, you were just going to be able to pick whatever kind of build you want, do whatever you wanted in the world, pick up all sorts of different jobs. There was going to be a ton of factions and a ton of characters and a ton of stuff to do in the city and that the city would be this really open place for you to just explore like absolutely everything and it's just not it's it's all window dressing um and in fact being on the ground level so much in the game actually reinforces this i think they, they try and keep you away from the insides of buildings and the roofs of buildings but honestly i feel like being on the ground all the time reinforces i'm like why can't i go like this i all i see is giant buildings in the sky everywhere around me and i can't go inside them and I can't go on top of them so all I'm seeing is flat city streets and it's just reinforcing this idea that there's nothing here you know uh, the people on the sidewalk don't feel like people again they just feel like NPCs um, they do sort of react to you a bit I mean if you bump into them they get pissed um, and they just generally talk about stuff but I mean, again it's the same shit you've seen in every other open world game honestly it doesn't even feel that much different from like an Assassin's Creed, like Assassin's Creed Unity or something like that. In fact, Assassin's Creed Unity is a very apt example of this. It's just like, okay, here's a bunch of shit for you to collect and find and do. Uh, you can't interact with the game world outside of that, uh, by and large. And uh, you can't really go inside of anywhere. Just have fun running around, doing your things and, and, and whatever, you know? And it's just like, okay, we're tired of the Assassin's Creed, Far Cry, Ubisoft, open world. We want something more. And this was Cyber, uh, CD Projekt Red's opportunity to give us something more. I remember there was initial reports of the game that um, uh, you could walk across the entire city in just a couple of minutes. And I was like, well, you know what? If the open world's really that small and they've been working this long on it, then it is going to be like Deus Ex Mankind Divided. You'll be able to go into absolutely every single building, every single floor, every single apartment, and I'm okay with that. That's what I want. But again, I don't know why they keep doing this in gaming. I think it's because these games keep selling, but they don't realize people are buying them because they just want the entertainment, but not necessarily that they want that game anymore, you know? Like, yeah, Assassin's Creed is entertaining enough. I don't think you'll be absolutely bored playing Assassin's Creed. I mean, there's enough to do and there's enough entertainment value there to be like, oh, I guess I'll play some more. But by and large, people are getting sick of that kind of game. So the only reason they buy it, they're just like, well, I guess, I don't know, I just want something to play right now, something new. And that's not where you want to be. You want people to be absolutely losing their minds over your game. And I think everyone just thought because Witcher 3 was kind of a game changer for the industry and it, it kind of came out of left field that they'd be able to make something... When again, they were I, for me, for my money, it, everything seemed a little vague um, when they were talking about Cyberpunk. I think they did sort of allude to the fact that it was going to be a lot more uh, like what people were expecting, um, not realizing that it's basically just another Assassin's Creed or Far Cry or whatever. Um, and, you know, are those games fun? Yeah, they can be fun. And is this game fun? Yeah, it's fun. It's got... You know, like I said, the, the hacking and shooting and all those kind of mechanics and stuff like that, they're pretty fun. 
you know, and the me- they put a lot of effort in the melee system too. But just combat or, or sneaking through buildings is not going to carry an open world RPG like this. There has to be a reason for me to go out in the world. And there's not even any exploration because most of the things that you can do pop up on your, like all you have to do is drive through a neighborhood and it's all going to pop up on your map. So there's no point in exploring most of the time either, you know. Um, and as I said too, even if you try and explore, you can't go anywhere really that you're not already supposed to go because of some sort of side quest, which is just infuriating. So, um, just keep in mind if you're going to play this game, expect an open world that's kind of like a mix between, yeah, it's like a mix between GTA and Far Cry, um, or a GTA and a, and a Assassin's Creed, um, with gameplay that borrows heavily from Deus Ex, uh, I mean, it feels almost exactly like Deus Ex Mankind Divided, especially with the hacking and everything like that, um, and, uh, expect a really, you know, basically just stick with the side quests and the main campaign, you know, and you're going to get, the, again, that's the other issue that my biggest problem is I think that they sacrificed stability. I think that they sacrificed like stability performance and bugs. I think that they sacrificed, um, openness to the world. I think they sacrificed depth to the open world. I think they sacrificed interactivity. I think they sacrificed interesting gameplay mechanics and systems like faction systems and having a life outside of the side missions. I think they sacrificed all of that to be able to have high quality animations of Keanu Reeves and the other characters in the game and this story that was so fucking important to them but I honestly didn't really give a shit about. And especially towards the end of the story, you're just like, you don't really feel bad for your character. Um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna put any spoils, but I mean I, I didn't feel bad for my character at all. And I didn't I didn't think that what the my character wanted to do with with you know, the resources and people uh, that she had available at the end of the game was a good use of time or resources. I thought it was dumb. Um another thing too is the story is a little bit undercooked. Uh there's a couple of main antagonists in the game that don't get any development and you don't even really have a showdown with them. Um Another thing is is that everyone's talking about how evil the corporations are all the time. I mean, you run into them occasionally, but outside of that, in the open world, you don't go inside their buildings. You can't go inside their buildings. You can't... Um, uh, you know, honestly, think about it like this. If you were to take Hitman 2 and paste all those levels together into one giant level, it would be maybe not as big as Night City in this game but it would be have a hell of a lot of stuff to explore and do. And, you know, Hitman 2 probably had a five-year development, anywhere from two to five-year development cycle. So I don't, it's not like they couldn't have done this. But seriously, when you play the campaign, there was so much time and money and effort that it went into voice acting, modeling the characters exquisitely, uh, animations, translation, because it's a, it's a Polish development team. All of this shit, right? All of this shit uh, probably cost tens of millions of dollars, took forever to do, and honestly, it came at the expense of what people really wanted. Like I said, the main character, CD Projekt, if, if anyone, they'll probably never see this video, but the main character of Cyberpunk 2020 is not Johnny Silverhand, it's not Keanu Reeves, it's not uh, the mercs, it's not rogue, it's not any of these people, the main character is fucking Night City, and if Night City is not interesting to explore, and there's not a ton of shit to do, and there's not a ton of ways in which the world will react to you, and you can react to the world, then what's the point? It's just a waste of time. So, that's what I would say. I will say this for the story, though, this is something I wish a lot of other games would do. Um, this was one brilliant thing that they did in the ending. So, um, if you think back to games like Fallout New Vegas, um, when the story ends, you get a little slideshow where a narrator tells you what happened to all the characters. So every little side quest that you did, where there were major decisions, or you had to like decide, yeah, decide someone's fate, or you had to, you know, whatever, um, you'll get a little slideshow montage of it, and it'll be sort of narrated. But not every single thing is addressed. Well, one thing I really appreciate about this game is instead of addressing the quests themselves, they address the characters, right? And the way that they do that is uh, there's a phone call system in the game. 
and uh, you know your, your the characters will call you and they'll, they'll give you like a little video uh, message or something like that so the brilliant thing that they did at the end of this game to sum up like okay this is what happened with all the decisions this is what happened with all the characters you interacted with is while the credits are rolling you get all the video messages for what they say on the, at the end of the game based on your decisions in the game and I thought that was brilliant you know they tell you what they're up to they tell you what uh, if they, they're hoping to see you again or not, or, you know, they tell you uh, how your decision uh, influenced their life and made it better or worse or anything like that. I thought that was brilliant. I really liked that. I thought it was a bit, because, it, again, it was more personal than just, like, some narrator and, like, a, a slideshow. Um, the character was talking to me, uh, expressing their feelings about whatever I did. But, again, I wasn't really looking for this largely character-driven, you know, experience. I was interested in the world. I didn't really give a shit about who, what the characters were. In fact, I was probably going to play, if it had been the game I wanted it to, I was probably going to play as a ruthless bastard and just kill pretty much everybody I meet. I wouldn't have kept too many friends, you know what I mean? Um, another interesting thing I got to say about the endings without spoiling anything is um, there are about four different endings. I've experienced three of them. Wait, hold on. There's, there's five different endings, right? I've experienced four of them. The interesting thing is that there is a there's a good ending that's clearly like the most cathartic ending and it, it it's like a nice little capstone on everything you've done in the game and the story of your character and the people that they're involved with and there's a sort of a bad ending right where it's very bittersweet and hollow and it doesn't really feel right you know and then there is another bittersweet ending where you get some of the things you want and you lose some of the things you weren't expecting to lose. And that's the canon ending. Because it ends on a cliffhanger. And we know CD Projekt Red's going to come out with DLC. I've just never seen that before where the, the uh, one of the bad endings turns out to be the canon ending that you, but there's also a good ending in the game. You know what I mean? Typically, they won't do that. Typically, there'll just be one ending at that point. So, it's a little strange that... Um, it's not a little strange. I just it, It's very strange that the canon is not the good ending. Because you can get an ending that's very cathartic, and it, honestly, it ties up everything in a neat bow. And actually, it is the longest ending. The most time and effort is given to that ending. Um... So you would think that that was the canon ending because everyone wants a happy... No, apparently uh, this is the canon ending. Um, one of the bad endings is the canon ending. So, um, And that's all I'm going to say. It doesn't... It shouldn't... As far as I know, that shouldn't really spoil anything for anybody. Because um, you're not going to know what the good or bad... I mean, there's really no way to determine what they're going to be. Um, so I would recommend just looking up a guide for how to get all the different endings and then just making a couple of uh, uh, save points to make sure that you can choose whatever you want to do from that save point. You don't have to spend hours and hours replaying everything. Um, but that that being said, I mean, yeah, obviously I like the Far Cry franchise. Um, I don't think the, mo the most profound for games ever. I do prefer Far Cry to something like this because Far Cry, Far Cry knows what it's about. So um, it knows its strengths, it knows its weaknesses, and typically it tries to play to its strengths. Um, and then, of course, there are there have been entries that are a little bit more open and, and involved and in depth that I like. You know, like Far Cry Two, Far Cry Four is another favorite of mine. Um, so, you know, if I compare it to Far Cry, it's not really uh, denigrating the game. Um, but I do have to point out that this, yeah, this is going to be more like Far Cry than it is like um, Skyrim or Fallout. You know, Fallout, you can explore a ton of stuff. And the city does feel big in Fallout because you can go inside the skyscrapers and go up to the roofs and things like that, you know. Even though it's a smaller... I'm pretty sure it's a smaller open world overall. Uh, Fallout 4 has a lot more depth to it. Um, you know, Fallout New Vegas has a ton more depth to it. Uh, Skyrim has a ton more depth to it, you know. And I think people wanted the depth of that game world to be able to go into and explore everything they wanted to with higher tech and, you know, a different studio doing it. And it's just not what you're going to get. And so I think that needs to be the biggest takeaway from this is that if you if you were kind of like, oh, that looks like a cool setting and, oh, I, 
I think some of that gameplay looks pretty cool. Just go go in and keep an open mind and, and just realize they're going to throw a lot of exposition, a lot of story, a lot of cutscenes, a lot of characters. You're going to be expected to play it kind of like a movie, and then you're going to be given a couple of interesting side quests to do, but don't expect much out of the open world. Um, there's just basically nothing there. So, which is really, really sad. And honestly, the open world is, it's pretty big, and I think it's too big for its own good, you know what I mean? Um, you compare it to something like Red Dead 2, which was also pretty big, but they, they packed a lot of detail into the different places um, to make sure that whether you're doing a side quest, a main story, or just riding your horse through the wilderness looking at the, the you know, the gorgeous views, you've always got something to do, you know? Whether that content is, is provided by... Um, Rockstar or whether it's provided by the player just kind of telling their own story And I think that's really my issue with the game is that it's not Telling it doesn't let you tell your own stories. It doesn't let you carve out your own life in Night City It, it has a pre-baked story for you. You RV you are American You're gonna go on this adventure you're gonna do X Y and Z regardless and there's not enough stuff outside of That for you to be able to feel like to role play as whoever you want to role play as in the game, which is a big problem if, since it's a role-playing game. Um, and as I drew comparisons to Deus Ex, and if, if you have been a fan of the channel and you've checked out my um, immersive sim series, um, I did put this in uh, as a list of one of the immersive sims, but that was based on the gameplay trailers that were out at the time, which, again, this game has a lot of influence for immersive sims, most notably Deus Ex, but after playing it, it's definitely not an immersive sim. Um, this game does not, it's not trying to be a simulation, um, and it's not really f that focused on immersion, and it's not really focused on player-authored experience, which are not the only, but some of the sort of main criterias. Um, there are some great simulations. I like I like that there is a day and night cycle. There are dust storms that can go through. There's there's uh, rain and stuff like that. You know, they, there's simulated AI with, you know, real traffic and and people out there and stuff like that. Gangs can get into little, you know, turf wars and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, that's not something we've never seen. It. This would definitely be an immersive sim light, you know, where it's taking a ton of those, um, you know, where it's taking a ton of those design elements um, that have been used in, in immersive sims. It's taking a ton of those, but it's it's not really, um, the game is too restrictive and it's not, there's not enough depth to it. You know, had it had more depth and been less restrictive, like I said, if I could have just become my own character, the character I wanted to be in the game, rather than the character that the game was telling me I needed to be, um, because they wrote this amazing story that they had to share with me. I mean, I just, I just didn't give a shit. Uh, it's not a bad story, but I just didn't give a shit about it from the get go. You know, so uh, for all of you guys wondering, no, this is not an immersive sim at all. It, I mean, like I said, it, it borrows a lot of gameplay elements for sure, but a lot of games do that. Most of the Far Cry franchise does it, but only two, in my opinion, would be really an immersive sim. The rest are just kind of like, I don't know, open world shooter type things. Um, so yeah, check it out if you want. Um, I would wait for some of the bugs to get ironed out because it, it can be a little bit frustrating. I do have to restart my game quite frequently um, to fix certain bugs. Uh, like I said, you know... Um, uh, I am sort of achievement hunting on this game, you know, I've got, like I said, 85% of the achievements and I did 100% of the side quests. Uh, I'm a little curious who that journalist was that said he was 200 hours in and still didn't beat the game or still wasn't done with it. I don't know what the fuck he was doing. The main campaign's only going to take you about 15 hours, maybe, um, if you blast right through it. And the way CD Projekt does their leveling system, you get the most XP from main story missions, so you don't really even have to worry about being super low level if you do that. Um... I will say this, uh, uh, the achievements that ask you to do all of the gigs and NCPD missions in a, in a certain city sector, uh, those did take a little bit longer than I was expecting. Um, it's, there's a lot there. There's a lot of, but again, they're all basically the same thing. Break into a place, bunch of bad guys, kill them all. Um, it, that gets very repetitive after a while. Um, but yeah, even after doing all of that, I mean, the, the other, the last few things that I have to do, I wasn't able to do just because I didn't. It wasn't in my build, you know. Some of them require certain cyberware that I'm not spec to use. Another one was uh, getting melee kills with swords. You know, I'm not spec for uh, sword combat, so I'm not. I haven't been killing a bunch of dudes with the swords. Um, like I said, I can easily reload a save just 
dump all the uh, the uh, surplus skill points I had laying around into one of the one or two of those skills and get those. So I will have done a hundred percent of everything, all of the endings and all of the achievements in about a hundred hours. So compare contrast that with Witcher Three. I've put about 250 hours into that game and I still haven't gotten every single achievement uh, there's only two left um, and I've only finished it twice so you know compare and contrast that it's also kind of light on content um, I mean I am of course talking about the game of the year editions of Witcher 3 so I mean knowing CD Projekt Red the DLC is likely to be fairly um, long but but I don't think it's going to add another 100-something hours to the game. Um, and um, quite frankly, I'm not that interested in the DLC. I mean, yeah, they could add stuff to the world, but, like, uh, unless, uh, you know, and I, I can't... I'm getting sick of having to say this about games. Unless they're going to go, you know, Rainbow Six Siege or uh, a better comparison would be uh, No Man's Sky. Unless they're going to go that route where they just continually add content to the game over the next series of months and I'm I'm talking a lot of content like you know now you can go into like all these like high-rise corporate buildings and like explore and steal shit and you know now you know we're gonna put in a faction system basically like giving you the second half of the game that should have been there from the get-go unless they're gonna do that um, there's really no way to save this game from being the disappointment that it is um, and I just have to say one more time, it is not disappointing because of the bugs. The bugs are something that can be fixed. And many of them have been fixed already. Um, it's like, I remember the day one game versus now. Totally, totally different. Already fixed a ton of stuff. So, um, it, it's stuff that can't be fixed. Much like I talked about in my Underworld Ascendant review. It's stuff that can't be fixed unless they want to remake the entire game, almost. And I don't think that the CD Projekt team wants to do that. Um, but I am a little disappointed that all of the media coverage is about the bugs right now and performance. Understandably so for at least the Xbox One and PS4 crowd because, I mean, the base Xbox One could only do 17 frames a second on launch. I think they have it up higher now. It's like 22 to 25, which is still pretty awful. But I, I wouldn't call this game playable till about 30. Um, but... Uh, yeah, you can understand. I mean, this, this game was... I, I understand that, but the bigger problem is that it's just not... We have played this game already. That's the other thing you're going to notice. You've already played this game in a bunch of other open-world games. It's not a new experience. It's nothing to write home about. And uh, that's a little disappointing, you know. Uh, not a little disappointing. That's uh, severely disappointing and you know i think people are hungry for a game like that out there somewhere and it's just not happening actually here's a funny thing if you want to play a cyberpunk game that lets you explore massive cities have a large degree of control over your player build and class however you want to uh tackle missions you can tackle in that way gives you a ton of different abilities gives you a ton of different ways to finish side quests um and you can explore almost every single inch of it i would say check out i divine cybermancy um, if you're getting, if you're waiting to get that immersive sim itch scratched, and you want a game that has a sort of dizzying level of depth, I would really check out I Divine Cybermancy. Um, it's on Steam. It's usually pretty cheap. Check that out. I would also recommend if you want to get your cyberpunk on checking out Deus Ex, the entire series, one, uh, Invisible War, Human Revolution, and Mankind Divided. My personal favorite being Mankind Divided. Um, I don't know why I just don't like Human Revolution as much. Um, and I, I think, honestly, when it launched, they played it too many times. They played it about three or four times around launch, so I think I'm just a little sick of it, too. It's harder to get sick of Mankind Divided, though, because it has a less restrictive uh, story structure. So if you want to, yeah, I, I would, uh, in fact, I'm going to be transitioning back to finishing up my Let's Play for the original Deus Ex um, as soon as I'm done with a few more things in Cyberpunk. And I'm, I'm you know, already the little bit of Deus Ex I've played is, is a lot more enjoyable than this game so uh i think you'll definitely get your money's worth out of it like i said it's a it's roughly a hundred hours if you want to do everything um but just keep in mind it's just not going to be that next level open world experience that just lets you completely explore and inhabit this giant cyberpunk city it's just it's just not going to give you that so keep that in mind 
All right, guys. Well, thanks for checking out this review. I know it went pretty long, but, um, you know, I had a lot to say about this game. Um, again, I have, you know, I've been playing it for 100 hours, and I also, I think I wanted to address everybody's expectations, and I wanted to address what the game actually is, and, and then talk about more specifics and stuff. So, uh, if you guys made it this far, uh, I salute you. Um, and uh, keep an eye out for more content on the channel. Thank you guys for watching. Um, that's it for me.